Lesson 5 The Testimony of the Samaritans Sabbath Afternoon October 26 Christ was the greatest teacher the world has ever known. He came to this earth to shed abroad the bright beams of truth that men might gain a fitness for heaven. For this cause came I into the world, he declared, that I should bear witness unto the truth. John chapter 18, verse 37. He came to reveal the character of the Father that men might be led to worship him in spirit and in truth. Man's need for a divine teacher was known in heaven. The pity and sympathy of God were aroused in behalf of human beings, fallen and bound to Satan's chariot car. And when the fullness of time was come, he sent forth his Son. The one appointed in the councils of heaven came to this earth as man's instructor. The rich benevolence of God gave him to our world, and to meet the necessities of human nature, he took humanity upon himself. Councils to Parents, Teachers, and Students, page 259. In the temple at Jerusalem, a low wall separated the outer court from all other portions of the sacred building. Upon this wall were inscriptions in different languages stating that none but Jews were allowed to pass this boundary. Had a Gentile presumed to enter the inner enclosure, he would have desecrated the temple and would have paid the penalty with his life. But Jesus, the originator of the temple and its service, drew the Gentiles to him by the tie of human sympathy, while his divine grace brought to them the salvation which the Jews rejected. The Desire of Ages, page 193. Close by the Israelites who had set themselves to the task of rebuilding the temple dwelt the Samaritans, a mixed race that had sprung up through the intermarriage of heathen colonists from the provinces of Assyria with the remnant of the ten tribes which had been left in Samaria and Galilee. In later years the Samaritans claimed to worship the true God, but in heart and practice they were idolaters. During the period of the Restoration, these Samaritans came to be known as the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin. Hearing that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and expressed a desire to unite with them in its erection. Let us build with you, they proposed, but the privilege they asked was refused them. Ye have nothing to do with us to build an house unto our God the leaders of the Israelites declared, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus the king of Persia hath commanded us. Ezra chapter 4 verses 1 to 3. Had the Jewish leaders accepted this offer of assistance, they would have opened a door for the entrance of idolatry. They discerned the insincerity of the Samaritans. They realized that help gained through an alliance with these men would be as nothing in comparison with the blessing they might expect to receive by following the plain commands of Jehovah. Prophets and Kings, pages 567 and 568. Sunday, October 27. The Setting of the Encounter Christ recognized no distinction of nationality or rank or creed. The scribes and Pharisees desired to make a local and a national benefit of the gifts of heaven and to exclude the rest of God's family in the world. But Christ came to break down every wall of partition. He came to show that his gift of mercy and love is as unconfined as the air, the light, or the showers of rain that refresh the earth. The life of Christ established a religion in which there is no caste, a religion by which Jew and Gentile, free and bond, are linked in a common brotherhood equal before God. No question of policy influenced his movements. He made no difference between neighbors and strangers, friends and enemies. That which appealed to his heart was a soul thirsting for the waters of life. He passed by no human being as worthless, but sought to apply the healing remedy to every soul. In whatever company he found himself, he presented a lesson appropriate to the time and the circumstances. Every neglect or insult shown by men to their fellow men only made him more conscious of their need of his divine human sympathy. 
He sought to inspire with hope the roughest and most unpromising, setting before them the assurance that they might become blameless and harmless, attaining such a character as would make them manifest as the children of God. The Ministry of Healing, page 25. The Savior longed to unfold to his disciples the truth regarding the breaking down of the middle wall of partition between Israel and the other nations, the truth that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs with the Jews and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 14 and chapter 3 verse 6. This truth was revealed in part at the time when he rewarded the faith of the centurion at Capernaum, and also when he preached the gospel to the inhabitants of Sichar. Still more plainly was it revealed on the occasion of his visit to Phoenicia when he healed the daughter of the Canaanite woman. These experiences helped the disciples to understand that among those whom many regarded as unworthy of salvation, there were souls hungering for the light of truth. The Acts of the Apostles, page 19. In the days of Christ, selfishness and pride and prejudice had built strong and high the wall of partition between the appointed guardians of the sacred oracles and every other nation on the globe. But the Savior had come to change all this. The words which the people were hearing from his lips were unlike anything to which they had ever listened from priest or rabbi. Christ tears away the wall of partition the self-love, the dividing prejudice of nationality, and teaches a love for all the human family. He lifts men from the narrow circle that their selfishness prescribes. He abolishes all territorial lines and artificial distinctions of society. He makes no difference between neighbors and strangers, friends and enemies. He teaches us to look upon every needy soul as our neighbor and the world as our field. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing Page 42. Monday, October 28. The Woman at the Well. Christ neglected no opportunity of proclaiming the gospel of salvation. Listen to his wonderful words to that one woman of Samaria. He was sitting by Jacob's well as the woman came to draw water. To her surprise, he asked a favor of her. Give me to drink, he said. He wanted a cool draft, and he wished also to open the way whereby he might give to her the water of life. How is it, said the woman, that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. John chapter 4 verses 7 to 14. The Ministry of Healing, page 27. How much interest Christ manifested in this one woman! How earnest and eloquent were his words! When the woman heard them, she left her water pot and went into the city, saying to her friends, Come, see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? We read that many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him. Verses 29 and 39. And who can estimate the influence which these words have exerted for the saving of souls and the years that have passed since then? Wherever hearts are open to receive the truth, Christ is ready to instruct them. He reveals to them the Father and the service acceptable to him who reads the heart. For such he uses no parables. To them, as to the woman at the well, he says, I that speak unto thee am he. The Ministry of Healing Page 28. You must seek to have an indwelling Savior who will be to you as a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The water of life flowing from the heart always waters the hearts of others. The water that Christ referred to was the revelation of His grace in His Word. His Spirit, His teaching, is as a satisfying fountain to every soul. 
In Christ is fullness of joy forevermore. Christ's gracious presence in His Word is ever speaking to the soul, representing Him as the well of living water to refresh the thirsting. It is our privilege to have a living, abiding Savior. He is the source of spiritual power implanted within us, and His influence will flow forth in words and actions, refreshing all within the sphere of our influence, begetting in them desires and aspirations for strength and purity, for holiness and peace, and for that joy which brings with it no sorrow. This is the result of an indwelling Savior. Ellen G. White comments in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1134. Tuesday, October 29. Sir, give me this water. The great difference between the Jews and the Samaritans was a difference in religious belief, a question as to what constitutes true worship. The Pharisees would say nothing good of the Samaritans, but poured their bitterest curses upon them. So strong was the antipathy between the Jews and the Samaritans that to the Samaritan woman it seemed a strange thing for Christ to ask her for a drink. Christ's Object Lessons, page 380 The Prince of Teachers, the Savior, sought access to the people by the pathway of their most familiar associations. He presented the truth in such a way that ever after it was to his hearers intertwined with their most hallowed recollections and sympathies. He taught in a way that made them feel the completeness of his identification with their interests and happiness. His instruction was so direct, his illustrations were so appropriate, his words so sympathetic and cheerful that his hearers were charmed. The simplicity and earnestness with which he addressed the needy hallowed every word. What a busy life he led! Day by day he might have been seen entering the humble abodes of want and sorrow, speaking hope to the downcast and peace to the distressed. Gracious, tender-hearted, pitiful, he went about lifting up the bowed down and comforting the sorrowful. Wherever he went, he carried blessing. The Ministry of Healing Pages 23 and 24. Jesus came to impart to the human soul the Holy Spirit, by which the love of God is shed abroad in the heart. But it is impossible to endow men with the Holy Spirit who are set in their ideas, whose doctrines are all stereotyped and unchangeable, who are walking after the traditions and commandments of men, as were the Jews in the time of Christ. They were very punctilious in the observances of the church, very rigorous in following their forms, but they were destitute of vitality and religious devotion. They were represented by Christ as like the dry skins which were then used as bottles. The gospel of Christ could not be placed in their hearts, for there was no room to contain it. They could not be the new bottles into which he could pour his new wine. Christ was obliged to seek elsewhere than among the scribes and the Pharisees for bottles for his doctrine of truth and life. He must find men who were willing to have regeneration of heart. He came to give to men new hearts. He said, A new heart also will I give you. But the self-righteous of that day and of this day feel no need of having a new heart. Jesus passed by the scribes and the Pharisees, for they felt no need of a Savior. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 386. Wednesday, October 30. The Revelation of Jesus. Jesus had begun to break down the partition wall between Jew and Gentile and to preach salvation to the world. Though he was a Jew, he mingled freely with the Samaritans, setting at naught the Pharisaic customs of his nation. In face of their prejudices, he accepted the hospitality of this despised people. He slept under their roofs, ate with them at their tables, partaking of the food prepared and served by their hands, taught in their streets, and treated them with the utmost kindness and courtesy. The Desire of Ages, page 193 The stay of Jesus in Samaria was designed to be a blessing to his disciples who were still under the influence of Jewish bigotry. 
They felt that loyalty to their own nation required them to cherish enmity toward the Samaritans. They wondered at the conduct of Jesus. They could not refuse to follow his example, and during the two days in Samaria, fidelity to him kept their prejudices under control. Yet in heart, they were unreconciled. They were slow to learn that their contempt and hatred must give place to pity and sympathy. But after the Lord's ascension, his lessons came back to them with a new meaning. After the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, they recalled the Savior's look, his words, the respect and tenderness of his bearing toward these despised strangers. When Peter went to preach in Samaria, he brought the same spirit into his own work. When John was called to Ephesus and Smyrna, he remembered the experience at Shechem and was filled with gratitude to the divine teacher who, foreseeing the difficulties they must meet, had given them help in his own example. The Desire of Ages, page 193. As soon as she had found the Savior, the Samaritan woman brought others to him. She proved herself a more effective missionary than his own disciples. The disciples saw nothing in Samaria to indicate that it was an encouraging field. Their thoughts were fixed upon a great work to be done in the future. They did not see that right around them was a harvest to be gathered. But through the woman, whom they despised, a whole city full were brought to hear the Savior. She carried the light at once to her countrymen. This woman represents the working of a practical faith in Christ. Every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. He who drinks of the living water becomes a fountain of life. The receiver becomes a giver. The grace of Christ in the soul is like a spring in the desert, welling up to refresh all and making those who are ready to perish eager to drink of the water of life. The Desire of Ages, page 195. Thursday, October 31. The Testimony of the Samaritans. The Pharisees despised the simplicity of Jesus. They ignored his miracles and demanded a sign that he was the Son of God. But the Samaritans asked no sign, and Jesus performed no miracles among them, save in revealing the secrets of her life to the woman at the well. Yet many received him. In their new joy they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. The Samaritans believed that the Messiah was to come as the Redeemer, not only of the Jews, but of the world. The Holy Spirit through Moses had foretold him as a prophet sent from God. Through Jacob, it had been declared that unto him should the gathering of the people be, and through Abraham, that in him all the nations of the earth should be blessed. On these scriptures, the people of Samaria based their faith in the Messiah. The fact that the Jews had misinterpreted the later prophecies, attributing to the first advent the glory of Christ's second coming, had led the Samaritans to discard all the sacred writings except those given through Moses. But as the Savior swept away these false interpretations, many accepted the later prophecies and the words of Christ himself in regard to the kingdom of God. The Desire of Ages, pages 192 and 193. The Savior is still carrying forward the same work as when he proffered the water of life to the woman of Samaria. Those who call themselves his followers may despise and shun the outcast ones, but no circumstance of birth or nationality, no condition of life, can turn away his love from the children of men. To every soul, however sinful, Jesus says, If thou hadst asked of me, I would have given thee living water. The gospel invitation is not to be narrowed down and presented only to a select few who, we suppose, will do us honor if they accept it. The message is to be given to all. Wherever hearts are open to receive the truth, Christ is ready to instruct them. He reveals to them the Father and the worship acceptable to him who reads the heart. For such he uses no parables. To them, as to the woman at the well, he says, I that speak unto thee am he. The Desire of Ages, page 194. When Jesus sat down to rest at Jacob's well, he had come from Judea, where his ministry had produced little fruit. 
He had been rejected by the priests and rabbis, and even the people who professed to be his disciples had failed of perceiving his divine character. He was faint and weary, yet he did not neglect the opportunity of speaking to one woman, though she was a stranger, an alien from Israel, and living in open sin. The Savior did not wait for congregations to assemble. Often he began his lessons with only a few gathered about him, but one by one the passers-by paused to listen, until a multitude heard with wonder and awe the words of God through the heaven-sent teacher. The worker for Christ should not feel that he cannot speak with the same earnestness to a few hearers as to a larger company. There may be only one to hear the message, but who can tell how far-reaching will be its influence? It seemed a small matter, even to his disciples, for the Savior to spend his time upon a woman of Samaria. But he reasoned more earnestly and eloquently with her than with kings, counselors, or high priests. The lessons he gave to that woman have been repeated to the earth's remotest bounds. The Desire of Ages, page 194. For further reading, My Life Today, The Bible Begets New Life, page 24, and Christ Triumphant, Christ Will Create a New Heart in His Followers, page 233.